This event is supported by the CCG, which is short for Climate Compatible Growth, and CCG is funded by the UK's FCDO, the Foreign Commonwealth Development Office. If you wish to ask a question throughout the event, please use Slido. The link is www.slido.com and the code is 2715656. So I'd now like to introduce to you the chair of today's session, Kuhn and Niley. Over to you. <laughs> oh, sorry, and they work for Imperial and CCG. Good afternoon, all. Thank you for joining us here in Charm uh, during COP27, uh, part of the CCG side events, and, uh, and welcome also to, uh, to our online audience. Great to have you here. Thanks for, uh, thanks for joining us. Um, we have an hour and a half to talk about ETC's Rapid Response Facility today, um, and I'll give a quick introduction on, on what that is for those of you uh, not familiar, and then we'll hear from uh, yeah, a number of excellent speakers on a number of uh, projects that have been part of this facility to provide technical assistance um, to countries in, in Africa and, and Asia. So before I talk and give an introduction on ETC and the RF, let me briefly introduce the, the speakers here, and I'll, I'll invite them again later when, uh, when it's their turn to, uh, to speak. Next to me here is John Cotton from um, Southeast Asia uh, Energy Transition Partnership, the ETP. Then we have Daniel Magashon um, from BASE, uh, the Basel Agency for Sustainable Energy. Then we have Faith Wandera Odongo joining us from the Ministry of Energy um, um, Government of Kenya. And then Beth Tennyson, uh, lastly, who is a um, member of CCG and um, works for the Center for Global Equality. And then we have two participants online. Um, so that is Ahmed Baroudi from SIE, Morocco Super um, ESCO, um, as well as Nile Shah, who is um, chairing the session together with me, um, joining us online as well. Um, I'll give a quick, uh, quick update on the ETC, um, but before that, Nile, do you want to say something as, as co-chair of this meeting? Uh, just to say thank you so much, everybody, for joining and, and welcome to the session. I really hope you find it interesting. For me, I, I have really found this new concept of the RRF to be a, a, a very powerful one if we, if we use it effectively. So I hope during this session we give you uh, some good insights into what we've achieved so far what we're hoping to do and, and help stimulate some thinking around how we can, can support a, a wide range of countries in the future. So thanks again for attending and I, I look forward to the rest of the session. Great, if you could put the agenda slide on please, then I'll tell you what we're doing today. Um, on the next slide, please. Um, I can use the clicker here, if you give me that. Thank you, John. Excellent, thank you. Yeah, so you just heard all the speakers' names who are uh, again on the, on the slide here with, with their affiliation. So what we'll, we'll do in the session is talk about the, the ETC and the Rapid Response Facility, which was set up um, in the run-up to COP26, um, which we held in the UK in Glasgow uh, by Alex Sharma, the COP26 president who launched this initiative. And um, we're here now, um, COP27, um, and we thought this would be a great opportunity to look back on that year um, and look at the progress that has been made and doing that uh, by highlighting a number of projects in different countries. So we have Morocco, um, then Vietnam, Philippines and Indonesia together as, as um, countries in Southeast Asia and then we'll zoom in on Kenya. So we have two African countries and, and uh, yeah, sandwiched in, we'll hear from, from Southeast Asia. Um, we'll talk um, about the technical assistance that was provided in these uh, country contexts um, and also talk about the ask that came from country. Um, and we're very glad that we have uh, Faith here from um, Ministry of Energy, as well as Ahmed um, from SIE, who were behind the request for technical assistance. So let's give a little bit of context on the Energy Transition Council, as I said, launched in the run-up to COP26. Um, it's a multilateral platform with um, um, over 30 governments and um, multilateral development banks, agencies, think tanks, partners, um, involved and uh, incorporating 20 countries in, in the global north and, and global south. And the, the, the idea here is to really promote a rapid um, transition to cleaner energy, to move away from coal uh, towards clean energy. And the uh, No More Coal statement in Glasgow 
yeah, we, we like to think is part of, of the initiatives that were, were taken here by the ETC. Um, it's an, a, a, a network, so it's bringing these countries together with, with various partners and organizations and to discuss um, the energy transition and identify gaps and challenges and, and, and needs um, and to, to allow countries to, to collaborate on that. And, and one of the mechanisms that the ETC um, initiated was the Rapid Response Facility, um, short RRF, um, delivering fast um, technical assistance responses to needs that were identified in the dialogues with countries. So very much a demand-driven um, approach, identifying those kind of projects that were obstacles in the energy transition for countries um, that were not um, being responded to by other programs, by, by other initiatives, and that were holding things back. Um, the aim to do that fast um, and to give countries the confidence that there was that support available and that allowed them to, to make commitments in the run-up to, to COP26 and we really hope to see more of that in, um, in, in this COP. So the Energy Transition Council has um, held a number of high-level uh, national dialogues um, focusing on the needs of individual countries, um, identifying what is going on, uh, where there are new priorities that emerge and support that is necessary. Um, then there were a number of ministerial meetings, and, and, and these were, were attended by ministers of, uh, of, um, of, of energy or related ministries uh, from these partner countries. Um, and in, um, in one of these ministerials, um, um, Alok Sharma launched the, the Rapid Response Facility. In addition to these bigger picture conversations, there have been hundreds of smaller meetings, one-on-one -on -one, uh, or in smaller groups, um, to look at technical assistance challenges. Um, and this was often facilitated by the FCDO um, in country, uh, the um, British High Commission or post in, um, in country to, to bring together local stakeholders and international partners. So going back to the rapid response facility, again, as I said, launched in the run up to COP26 um, as a coordination mechanism. It's not a funding mechanism in itself. Um, but it brought together a number of partners who had funding to provide this technical assistance. Um, and we estimated that to be around 10 million uh, pounds sterling for, um, for its first year um, that the delivery partners brought in to, to respond. So we've had and processed 27 requests from, from nine countries right now, and we'll hear from a number of them in, in, in the session. Um, but they're around a really broad range of of topics around energy efficiency, around grids, around clean cooking, around energy labeling, um, evaluation, monitoring and evaluation, around supporting the agriculture industry. Um, so there wasn't a limit on scope, but we meant to, um, to collect any of the challenges that needed addressing and needed addressing urgently. And as a result of that, even, even a year ago when most of these projects hadn't really started or, or were only just in the early stages, it gave countries the confidence to make these commitments. And, and we heard at these ministerial meetings, at, at networks afterwards, as well as, as, as in Glasgow, that countries did feel that support was helpful in, in them making these stronger commitments, uh, knowing that some of the technical challenges that they may face will be um, addressed by, by the international community. Um, so there are nine countries where we have requested uh, the flags and names of the, of the partner countries in, in, the, in the Global South are, are listed below, um, and we'll hear from, from a number of them. Um, since we're in Egypt, maybe I'll, I'll use that as, as an example. We had um, a request there coming out of the dialogues um, with, with, with Egypt that they needed support on integrating more renewables in the grid and, and upgrading their grid and planning for that to, to work. And as part of the discussion, also realized that electric mobility was a particular challenge. So out of that discussion, two projects came out um, that have been um, submitted to the RF. We have weekly, uh, sorry, monthly uh, meetings with all of these delivery partners, uh, chaired by Nile, and um, where we discuss um, the request and, and identify who's willing and able, who has the resources and the skills required to respond to that. And in the case of Egypt, it was the African Development Bank who stepped in and offered that aligned to some of their programs to, to do a study on electric mobility in Egypt, which they're, they're now delivering. And um, the, the scheduling constraints couldn't, couldn't join us here in, in person this time. But yeah, we have uh, a number of wonderful other um, case studies from the, from the countries listed, uh, listed here. 
Um, so most of the projects um, that started around COP time are in final stages now. We have a few new ones that are, we're just building consortiums on and, and developing. Um, and we have now um, the plan to, to move forward um, with the ETC and the RF past the handover to Egypt as COP president for the ETC to continue, supported by the donor governments and the institutions that are, that are listed here. Um, the print is probably a bit small if you're in the room, but it, yeah, it has uh, development banks, um, uh, various philanthropy organizations, um, agencies, um, think tanks, networks um, around the world that, that support this. And, and in particular, there are some 25 delivery partners who are again, mutual development banks, um, um, donor programs from countries, um, um, industry partners and, and networks that, that jump in and respond. And, and we'll hear from, from some of them today. The Energy Transition Council just launched uh, their, their website in the run-up to, to this COP, so uh, you can find a bit more information as well as these, um, these infographics again. So with that in, in, in mind, um, yeah, Nile, is there anything you wanted to add at this point before we ask our speakers to talk about these case studies? Uh, no, just to remind people now that the, the ETC website is, is live, so there's a lot more information there. Thanks. So we'll run through these three territories to look at a really a, a broad range of, of projects around energy efficiency, grid planning, clean cooking, um, wind. Uh, it's going to cover all of the areas that the COP is, is, is addressing. And we'll look specifically today um, at how the technical assistance has supported the country's energy transition and, and made a lasting, lasting impact. Um, not a quick leave and let things be, but to really unlock something much bigger. And um, hopefully we'll get to see here today how this, how this works. So from the um, territories, we'll, we'll start with, with Morocco. Um, we have here um, Ahmed Brody, who's the um, Director General of the, um, the Super ESCO in Morocco, SIE. Um, he um, was behind a request that was submitted to the RF, discussed in our network, and one of the uh, partners that raised our hand and says, yes, we, we, can prom we can work on this, we can support this, was the Climate Emergency Collaboration Group, CECG. We're still confusing that with CCG sometimes, but our, our partners at CECG, a philanthropy um, network, who had um, a really broad network of delivery partners and, uh, yeah, very pleased to have uh, to Daniel here to, um, to present their side. But Ahmed, first uh, over to you to, to briefly present the, yeah, the context for this request and the work that's going on and why this project on energy efficiency was so very important. Um, and you have, uh, you have about 10 minutes and I believe you'll get a, a warning if, uh, if that's helpful at the, at the time. Over to you, Ahmed, the floor is yours. Okay, okay thank you very much, uh, very happy to be to attend this uh, this meeting and thanks to offer to SIE the opportunity to present what we are trying to do in Morocco. Uh, very important for us. Uh, thanks to thanks to Rapid Response Facility and to CETG support. Very, you will very quickly understand how it's important for us to to have this support. Uh, if you uh, allow me, I will share with you a presentation I prepared. Uh, to introduce globally very quickly what is SIE, what we are doing, and uh, the global strategy in the country, and what is, and to illustrate the usefulness of the your support, the support of, of uh, CCG and the Rapid Response Facility to our strat national strategy in terms of energy efficiency. So I hope that you can see my screen. That looks good. Are you putting it in full screen mode, please? Yes, that's it. We can Perfect. see and hear you well. Thank you. Perfect. Well, uh, SIE is the Moroccan Super ESCO, uh, which uh, in fact uh, uh, has been cre created from the energy investment company at the beginning. And uh, uh, our objective is to leverage the energy efficiency market to boost the energy efficiency market in Morocco. Uh, that's our first objective. Uh, and to act in the Moroccan market as a third party, uh, trusted third party, uh, because we are 100% public. 
uh, and as also a facilitator for uh, public administration to, to to support our public administration as uh, you know uh, as an expert in energy efficiency. Uh, well, but to to do that, our conviction, uh, if we want to success and to reach the national objectives in terms of uh, uh, reduction of uh, energy consumption. Our conviction is to open the market to private investors and to private companies. Private sector has to be very, very dynamic in the in, in Morocco, and we are we are focusing all our efforts to reach this first objective to open the market, the Morocco market, to private. Exactly what we are trying to do. Our missions, uh, what are the markets allowed to SIE? We 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 have to address the all the public buildings of the country, the street lighting, but also the decarbonation of industry, and also, and we have also to address the sustainable mobility solutions to the country. Uh, very less energy consuming, of course, and uh, uh, a transversal objective is the, to support SMEs, private SMEs and private ESCOs in the country. Uh, we want also to share our model, our exper experience. We are ready to, to do that. And in fact, we started really uh, with uh, all, all the African countries. This experience sharing is very important and uh, for us. And it's a real will of my, my governance. That's why we have created, uh, we have announced that last COP in Glasgow, and now it's done. We have created an African Super ESCO club open to all uh, African Super ESCOs. They are all welcome. Uh, to It's a collaboration platform to exchange to, and to share our experience. The objective of all uh, of that is to boost the energy efficiency uh, market in Africa. Because as you know, uh, energy efficiency, it's, uh, it's um, a key sector for job creations, for sustainability, etc. So that's why we, we, we do our best to, to boost this, this sector. To summarize our, our strategy, four points. We want to, we, first, the first point is the rolling out of new of building blocks. Uh, we put in place in the market building blocks to, to, to open the market. We support private companies because we have to, we, have, we need to have a very, uh, you know, uh, a good uh, ecosystem, national ecosystem in terms of private companies, SMEs and private ESCOs. We, SIE is working hard to create the first success stories and we will deliver them by the end of this year and uh, at the beginning of 2010. Uh, Three, uh, and we work now with the, the most motivated private companies. And of course, we we need to measure the the result of what we are doing at the national level. That's why we are developing uh, SIE. It's developing not for SIE but for the Ministry of the Energy Transition, uh, one M MRB system, which is a measure and. and a, measurement and verification system to collect to collect all the results. You have all the mission uh, and the, the, the main functions of the, this MRV system here. And here, uh, first, for this, uh, for this uh, key element in our strategy, thanks to UK Rapid Response Flight City support, support uh, we have closed very successfully the first phase. Uh, and uh, now we have to pass to the second phase in order to, to deliver to the country this, this system of rational. Uh, this slide is to summarize the building blocks. The first of them is the development of uh, a project pipeline. This project pipeline, we in fact, we never do by ourselves. We outsource everything to private companies. And this pipeline, we prepare, in fact, uh, the, the uh, pipeline of projects for the private sector. Uh, we also have uh, uh, initiate one initiative uh, to facilitate the connection between private companies 
and banks, commercial banks. Uh, we, we are doing that with the support of uh, the Bayes, the Swiss Bayes Foundation. Daniel is with us, and thanks to Bayes so for, for, for the, the job done. And uh, I will I let uh, Daniel to, 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 to present that. Uh, the principle is to facilitate, you know, the, the access to fundings and to, 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 to funds for, for energy efficiency private uh, company uh, with banks. And here also, it, for this break, thanks to UK Rapid Response Facility support, we are also, uh, we have uh, signed agreements with private uh, companies for fundings. Uh, it's very important for us because we have to prepare on the search solutions for private company again. Um, we, it's another building block. We have already something like uh, five or six uh, agreement operational today. And also we have uh, for market financing, we are trying to launch green bonds uh, for fundings. I don't know if we can, if we will do it or not, because we have to comply with Moroccan law first. We, and uh, uh, I am, we are finalizing this, uh, this study to with the Moroccan law alignment. If we, if it's possible, then I will submit that to my board to obtain the to obtain the decision. We have also one demand to the Green Climate Fund. Uh, it's not easy for us to do that, and uh, I here again thanks to CECG support uh, to to help us. To, to, to present our demand to, to obtain this uh, accreditation for the, the, the Green Climate Fund. It will allow us to address uh, wonderful projects with a lot of compo uh, ESG components. I hope that we, that we will success uh, on that. And the last, uh, the last you know, uh, building blocks is the carbon credits. This carbon credit is very important. You know, it, we are not doing that for, for SIE. We are doing that for private companies or for project owners, private own, uh, project owners. When they, uh, a project owner is uh, doing efforts to decarbonize his industry, it's normal to help them, to give, it, to give him all the support or the, to facilitate him the access to carbon credits because it's uh, a normal uh, financial feedback to do that. Speaking, but, please. Sorry? A few minutes speaking, please. Okay. To, to do that, we have, we have signed an agreement with the US Carbon Registry, and now we have a um, broken carbon registry, which is certified. We are, the, 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 it's completely operational today, and we, are, we know how to certify carbon credits for, for, for in Morocco, and not only in Morocco, a global accreditation obtained from from UNFCC and IMF. Uh, well, that's the the main the main elements I I wanted to share with you, and I'm be happy to answer to any questions. Right, thank you very much, Ahmed. <clears throat> really good to to hear the examples and, and just to, to stress there was indeed more than one request that came from Morocco through this pathway that is being responded to. Um, and, uh, and since we're looking back, um, Ahmed, a, a year ago you, you came to Glasgow, but I remember that we meant to, to meet also at base, but then the quarantine rules at, at the time uh, meant that you had to <laughs> dial in from across the, <laughs> the street. Um, it would have been great to have you here in person, but thanks for taking the time in your, in your travel schedule to, uh, to join us here. Uh, Daniel, can I give the uh, microphone to you. Oh, you have your, your yeah. own microphone. As, um, yeah, Managing Director of Bayes and have been working on applying a model um, to the Moroccan context as a, as a result of this request. And That's correct. Thanks for uh, sharing your, your thoughts on that. Yeah. Floor That's correct. And first of all, uh, thank you for the invitation uh, to, to share this project. Uh, and as well, well uh, the appreciation to Ahmed and, the, and his team because he's a fantastic partner to work with in implementation of this project. So well, what we're trying to do here is to transform the energy efficiency market in Morocco. Uh, and for that, uh, we have to understand a little bit of the characteristics of energy efficiency, which normally is seen as the 
no sexy investment side of, of sustainable energy, uh, which is not true because the, the profits on energy efficiency can be super high, but uh, for many reasons, uh, energy efficiency has not been able to move faster as, as it should be moving. Um, one of the main barriers of energy efficiency is that uh, most of the high energy efficiency equipments require a higher investment than a conventional equipment. So if you want to buy a high energy efficiency uh, air conditioning system, if you want to buy a high energy efficiency boiler, normally you have to pay 10, 15, 20, 30 percent more uh, than a conventional equipment. And the customer has to believe, has to pay, and has to believe that the savings are going to come in the future. And this is where the com problem comes, because the market is very corrupt. Nobody, there's a lack of trust between the stakeholders. Um, and people tend to preference uh, the initial investment, which is called normally CapEx, the capital expenditure, and they don't look the operational expenditure, the OPEX. Well, guess what? You know, when you accumulate and you do analysis of different technologies operating and you, comp you aggregate the CapEx and the OPEX for a certain period of time, you realize that the CapEx portion is a smaller portion of of the cost. Um, we have some analysis already that in warm places, um, the CapEx represents uh, somewhere between 5 and 6% of the total cost. And the other 94% or 90-something percent are things related with energy and maintenance. And people is not overlooking that. It's, uh, it's, it's overlooking that part. It's just taking the decision on the um, cheaper aspect. And why, uh, we have an example. Uh, Globally, the air conditioning systems, which are sold um, 10 every second, so we are growing very fast, um, the average efficiency of these systems is one-third of what you can find of higher efficiency in the shelves. So um, we are buying super inefficient uh, appliances. So here the challenge that we have is how do we change the perception of people? How do we change the decision-making process behind and it's about trust. It's about providing credibility. So if you are going to invest in something that is claiming that it's going to deliver savings, it's because you have the certainty that it's going to happen, not because you believe and everybody believes. And, but no, it's because you have the certainty for that. So basically, the energy savings insurance, what it's doing is that. It's putting elements on the table that provides credibility. So there's a contract that is very well established, uh, the responsibilities between the provider, the seller, and the client, and the, basically the, the seller is saying, yes, I commit and I sign, and if this is not happening, I will pay to you the compensation for what was not achieved. The second element is an insurance. So if that provider doesn't pay you, for the customer perspective, the insurance is going to pay me. So you have a very high credibility on top. And we have uh, other aspects uh, related with the uh, monitoring, and uh, we have a management information system that is based in blockchain that actually gives transparency on the whole process of, of evaluation. So that's what we are trying to do in, in Morocco. We have been working in the last months very hard with the, with the SIE uh, team, the uh, Ahmed team, developing the contract. Basically, the contract establishes the rules of the game, and uh, this is a contract that aims to be used by the two parties, the, by one side, you have the customer, and the other side, you have uh, a technology provider. Then, as well, we are engaging insurance companies in, in all this, and it has to be a business for them as well. So they have to understand the risk associated to this. And as well, it has to be a product that is, is not expensive. So normally, we end up uh, of, uh, in cost of, uh, that range between 1% or 2% of the total value of the project, and then you are insured on your uh, energy savings for the next five years. So that's, that's the deal. Um, and the third element is basically uh, <coughs> we need a referee. Because we have learned that, OK, you, we, you and I signed. You are the provider. I'm the customer. We agreed that we come here in one year to measure you know, if the savings were achieved or not. And there might be a disagreement. You might say, uh, I achieved the savings. And the other party might say, no, you didn't. And now you have to compensate to me. So we need a referee, someone that you can call, both parties call, and they say, okay, you know, tell us who is right. And that, that actor, which we call the validation entity, becomes crucial as well for the insurance company because the insurance company needs to know who to believe. Um, so we have this, this party that 
is an independent uh, technical validation that um, we, we put them in the contract as, as uh, the party that they can call in the case of the disagreement. Those, so these three elements, the, um, the contract, the insurance, and this uh, role of the validation entity is what we call the energy savings insurance. And um, it comes a fourth element here on the table because the type of projects, uh, when we talk about energy efficiency praise, we normally are talking about small scale investments. These are not the large scale wind farms or solar farms. We are talking about projects that can range from $5,000 to $10,000 to $50,000. And if we see the composition, in this case, the project is focused in uh, enterprises. Um, 95 or more than 96% of the enterprises in Morocco are SMEs. Uh, so the, and, and the, 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 big portion, the big portion of projects that are gonna come in energy efficiency are from SMEs, are the small scale investments. So they will require financing. And normally <laughs> you have to understand that an SME has difficulties to access financing. And they have as well to take a decision if they have to invest in a new uh, a high efficient motor or if they can, if they have to pay salaries. So as well, they are in, a, in a, these decisions of, of how to use more efficient their money in, and their financing, the limited financial capacities. So here comes the financing and for the bank as well, it becomes super attractive to have a customer that is asking for a credit that has on the back an insurance. Why? Because, okay, I'm gonna lend to you, uh, but now I realize that you have a product that is somehow securing the future cash flows that are somehow going to guarantee me that you are gonna be able to, pay, to have the money to pay to me. So that's where the whole circle is closed. And for the financial sector, the banks, they are quite used for uh, financial products. So every time that you go and ask for a loan for a mortgage, for example, they ask you a bunch of insurance, you know, there's even a life insurance. If you, for some reason, die, the insurance will pay the mortgage. If you go and ask for a loan for a car, they ask you for a bunch of insurance on the car. Uh, well, that's what we are as well trying to drive the market. If you finance an energy efficiency project, you should ask that your client has an energy savings insurance. Very logic. So that's what we are trying to do uh, in the market. We are trying to mainstream this mechanism. So uh, as well, there's a lot of education in, in the market with the different players, with the customers, uh, with the providers. And as well, we are trying to systematize this in a way that um, is attractive for the insurance companies, attractive for the bank, it's attractive for the cl client. And it's on, the, on this boundary, on the size of the type of size of projects that we are talking about here. Uh, so that's what is the project about. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel, that's great. And also good to hear that that turned out to be exactly what, what Morocco needed and what SIE said that is gonna help them in this challenge to yeah, facilitate that, that transition and have um, energy efficiency uh, yeah, on the agenda. And, yeah, I think you'll be happy to hear that in this meeting the last few days, energy efficiency certainly has come up a few times uh, in transport as well as electricity systems. So, yeah, scary number of air conditioning units being sold. sold that's, yeah, if they're more efficient, it, it makes a huge difference and we just need to generate less electricity to, to solve that. Yeah, thanks very much. I want to remind the audience here as, as well as online to, to please ask some questions at the end of um, the presentations. We have, uh, we have half an hour for, for discussion and very much looking forward to that. So please ask questions, uh, so especially cool, we've, got some, we've got some questions coming on on Slido, so we'll, we'll leave those for the Q&A session, yeah? Let's do that, Excellent. exactly. Good. Exactly. So thanks very much, um, Ahmed and, and Daniel, for, for highlighting that, that work done uh, through the RF in Morocco. Then, yeah, moving on to, to you, John. You know the RF very well. Um, you're at um, SETP now, um, Senior Program Manager, um, looking after um, work done in the region. Uh, but before ETP, you worked for the FCBO and um, been helping the RF um, extract requests from, from Laos, where you were based then, and uh, it's really good to to finally meet you in person <coughs> here uh, in Egypt, of all places. Uh, so, um, yeah, the, the floor is yours. I can give you the clicker to advance to your slides. They should be up in, in a second. Um, and again, these, um, yeah, 
an opportunity to, for, uh, for you to hear an, an, a number of projects that took place in Southeast Asia as a result of gaps that were identified in that dialogue process um, uh, submitted as a request to the RF, then being, um, being shared with partners and in, in the projects that we will hear about now, it was ATP that, that raised our hand and said we can help facilitate that. We, we want to support the transition projects in this region. So, John, over to you. Look forward to hearing uh, updates on these, uh, on these projects. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Thank you very much. And it's, uh, thank you for the invite. It's very nice to be here today. Um, so one year ago, I was here, at least virtually, to Glasgow. Uh, I was wearing a different hat then with the FCDR. Um, at the time, I was very attracted to the IRF and the ETC's work, mainly it being a demand-driven program. That was highly attractive to me in Laos, having experienced a lot of organizations trying to parachute support into the country. Uh, when I first approached the minister, uh, he started laughing when I said, there's some support available, and he pointed to a shelf full of reports and said, uh, just promise me you won't bring me another report, something like this. And uh, my experience so far with the ETC and the IRF is that it is very much demand-driven, and uh, I think this is a, a very important underlying feature. Um, so since a couple of weeks after that, I started working with ETP, um, and I was able to see through ETP uh, how the RRF is then implemented. ETP, as you mentioned, put its hand up for several uh, technical assistance in Philippines, Vietnam, and Indonesia. Uh, ETP are very, very ambitious and very active in these three countries, and uh, the RRF requests are very much aligned with what ETP are doing. So what I'm going to do today is introduce the Energy Transition Partnership uh, and then explain how ETP has taken these RRFs, how they're delivering them, give a status update, and then explain where we hope to take these into the future to see them really reach their fruition, which is uh, the, the main outcomes of uh, essentially reducing uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so yeah, so last year I think, uh, um, was the beginning. Uh, we haven't reached net zero yet, we're far from it, but but I think it's a big takeaway is we're not at ground zero and we're definitely on the right journey now. Uh, so next slide please, I think I'm talking to myself. Okay, so I'll, I'll talk to this slide first. Um, so, the, so the Energy Transition Partnership, the Southeast Asian Energy Transition Partnership, it's a platform uh, bringing together philanthropies and governments uh, our government members include uh, the UK, Canada, France, Germany, and philanthropies such as the uh, Children's Investment Fund, IKEA Foundation, and others. And what brings these uh, organizations, this diverse group of organizations together, is a joint goal to accelerate the energy transition in Southeast Asia. And that's a very powerful joint goal that they share. And we as the Secretariat are very lucky to be able to apply this joint ambition in the region. Uh, we're, we're unhindered by um, by any, any complex decision making, actually, we have a very clear mandate, and that is to drive the energy transition in the region. So engaging with the governments in the countries, uh, we look for the most appropriate technical assistance and support for the governments in order to drive this. And we get, we're able to leverage and have the support of the governments and philanthropies behind us. All of this under the UN flag um, makes us a very, very uh, effective uh, model in delivering technical assistance, as we can see in the RRF requests that we delivered. Next slide, please. Okay, so a quick overview of ETP. We were born of discussions that came out of the One Planet Summit and the Climate Action Summit, high-level dialogues in 2018 and 2019, and then NOPS uh, became the fund manager. Um, we were initially granted five years to deliver the program, um, but just, just last month at our steering committee meeting, this has been extended to 2035 now. Uh, which, which is first a reflection on how the work is going and also uh, how the momentum can be applied over the next uh, 15 years now, 13 years, in order to see this work through to meet the uh, Paris climate goals. We work primarily in Indonesia, Philippines and Vietnam uh, in constant interactions with the governments and we're very much a demand-led program, uh, both supporting and empowering the governments to take ownership of their own energy transitions. So. We work under four strategic outcomes, and I'll quickly reference this in the context of the RRF as well. Um, we strengthen RE and EE policies. What this means is, as countries' climate commitments are increasing, for example, the pre-COP26 world and the post-COP26 world look quite different. 
uh, as countries across Southeast Asia in particular announced no new call or announced net zero commitments, the policies need to align to see these commitments come to fruition. So our ETP works delivering technical assistance to support the governments achieve policies to help them achieve their climate goals. And one example here is um, in Vietnam, and I'll talk a little bit more about this later, was an abatement scenarios paper. Uh, with the RRF, ETP did, a, did an analysis of potential uh, energy sector projections in Vietnam, uh, looking at wind solar energy efficiency. Uh, and we, we, we have information that leads us to believe that this was a strong driver in uh, Vietnam's commitment to net zero at uh, COP26 last year. Uh, so that's very much aligned with your introduction of what the main purpose of the RRF was. Uh, this, this is a good illustration how, of how a technical assistance provided by ETP could leverage on the high-level dialogues of uh, the UK government during COP26 to really deliver a strong uh, outcome there. Uh, we work on increasing smart investments. Um, so this means we're, we're trying to unlock, or we aim to unlock, finance into renewable energy and energy efficiency projects, and this is a long journey. Um, so this means working through multiple barriers in order that finance can come uh, eventually online. Uh, sustainable, resilient infrastructure, uh, by this we basically mean smart grids. So where, where the first pillar there allows us to uh, uh, have the policy in place to bring in RE and EE initiatives, the second brings in the finance, the third is really having the infrastructure so it can actually be applied, um, which is a, a critical element. I'll give some examples of this later. Uh, and capacity development, so empowering the government and other stakeholders to have the skills to first see the opportunities within the energy transition and then also to deliver it once it's on the ground. Um, so ETP is a platform our, at our heart is uh, collaboration. Uh, so just like the ETC and RRF, the, the philosophy behind this was to bring multiple parties together. ETP's mandate is founded on the same. So we work with think tanks, private finance, civil society, uh, academia. Um, we're willing and open to work with anybody and bring anybody into our, into our projects and collaboration in order to effectively uh, expedite the energy transition. Okay, so now I'll come on to the um, specific RRF uh, responses that ETP are, are delivering on. So, I mean, the ultimate goal of uh, ETP is to meet the Paris goals. Um, this is primarily by decarbonizing the energy sector. Um, in order to do this, we have to have complete government buy-in and the government needs to take ownership and leadership of delivering the energy transition. Um, in order for them to do that, they need technical techno-commercial feasibility uh, to show that it can be done. I think this is possibly the easiest part, um, but the work is essential that it will happen. Uh, secondly, and possibly more important, is a socio-political aspect to the energy transition uh, to ensure that all four of these aspects are aligned in order for when the policy window opens. And I think in Vietnam it's just opened with a jet P, that solutions are on the table and that um, that policy amendments can be made in order to drive the uh, climate commitments forward. So the first response that uh, ETP responded to was the coal abatement scenarios. Um, so in this, in this study, um, ETP looked at various uh, pathways forward um, for the power development planning. Uh, it was a combination of uh, energy efficiency and renewable energy. And the outcome of this paper, which was handed over uh, to the Vietnamese government, um, was that we strongly believe it led to the uh, net zero commitments of Vietnam. Um, that was only the beginning, and ETP have continued this work. At present, we're, we've taken this into two, two strands. Uh, one, we're now working with the uh, CMSC, the Center for the Management of State Capital of Vietnam, and we're developing a net zero roadmap for their state-owned enterprises. Um, in Vietnam at present, I believe we're the only entity working with the government on their coal phase down. Um, and this, is, this, this demonstrates the trust that the uh, government of Vietnam have, have, have put in us. Um, and also gives us a responsibility to make sure we, uh, we, we, we do this work to the justification that it needs. And we're also working on this coal abatement scenarios. We're taking this to net zero. When this, when this paper was initially launched, we were informed that it was perhaps uh, 
are contentious, are, are too ambitious, that Vietnam hadn't considered any coal phase down and that this was a very delicate area to go into. Um, somewhat protected or supported by the UN flag, uh, we, we, we took on this paper and we now have the ability to take this actually all the way to net zero and to start looking at coal phase down. So this is, this is very significant uh, developments over the last uh, 12 to 18 months. Um, another RRF response we've just responded to recently is the Offshore Wind Energy Centre of Excellence. Um, this is a new initiative that the UK government has uh, promised to the Vietnamese government to support with such a centre of excellence. Um, ETP are working uh, in wind development across all of the three countries we're working in, and we want to s find a way to bring the policy in line and then the financing to realise the, uh, the, the, the huge offshore wind energy potential of Vietnam. So in the, Philipp oh no. in the Philippines, uh, we have a lot of RF responses. Uh, the first one is the Marine Renewable Energy uh, Stock Take Report. Um, so this was a request to study, okay, okay, I'll go a bit quicker. I have two minutes left. So in, in the Philippines, uh, we've responded to Marine Renewable Energy Stock Take Report. I'll talk more broadly on this. We're also working on marine spatial planning and on wind permitting. These are all interlinked. This is using the marine space both for wind energy and other emerging technologies. Um, it's our intention to drive these projects all the way to the outcome and see wind projects realized in the Philippines. Um, other work we did in the Philippines include uh, grid diagnostics, smart grid roadmap. This is also an incredibly exciting piece of work where the, where the country is at loggerheads in developing its uh, transmission and distribution, particularly the transmission backbone. So this is, we're working on how developing a financing roadmap in order to see the realization of the grid in the Philippines so it can actually take on uh, the uh, renewable energy. And these are all interlinked that have gone very quickly. And also working with the RRF, we're hosting the Energy Efficiency Technical Working Group in the Philippines. Okay, and finally in Indonesia, so this wasn't a direct uh, response to an RRF, but it came through the FIRE dialogues. So this is a study on the financial implications of the early coal-fired power plant retirement. What this means is we're looking at what is the implications if the government of Indonesia follows its uh, coal-fired power plant retirement now. What are the implications on PLN? What are the implications on a fiscal state? And we will use this, and the government will use this to allow them to develop ideally a more ambitious and uh, expedited coal retirement pathway and we're bringing in our working with support in the government of Indonesia and bringing in various financing mechanisms in order to achieve their uh, coal phase down. And I went through that very quickly. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, I'm available for questions, happy to talk more and already speaking with some of uh, the panelists and CCG, I know there's areas of opportunity for collaboration. Of course, we're very much open to that. Thank you. Thank you, John. <laughs> and you were saying that 15 minutes was very generous, but you're just doing so much brilliant work, and it's really good to hear that all together in, uh, yeah, in one presentation. So, yeah, we'll come back in the discussion. Um, we'll move to Kenya next. And, and before I, I introduce Beth to, to speak um, about the work CCG is doing, I just wanted to highlight the role of CCG in the RF. Um, the RF launched by the EPC, um, and the CCG as an FCDO funded program have been asked to support some of the secretariat roles in the RF, um, which is where Nile and, and, and my um, role comes from. And we're working very closely with the E3G um, and, and wider ETC team um, to, to run the facility. But at the same time, um, CCG is also one of the partners to deliver work in this project. So, so while my role is more on the coordination side, Beth and, and, and many of the colleagues in, in the team um, are working on the responses. So in this case, it was CCG raising hand to a request on two um, projects in Kenya on energy planning and clean cooking. And Beth, a few minutes for you to introduce the project and then uh, Dave can comment. Sure, yep. thank, you. Thank, you. thank you very much. And can I have the uh, clicker as well? Unless you want to do the slides, John. No. <laughs> Okay, great. Um, yes, thank you very much for that and for introducing the role of CCG because it is sort of 
um, complicated and a bit complex. So uh, yes, I'm very pleased to be discussing here today um, about two of the responses that came through from the government of Kenya. Um, and then I will hand over to Faith to talk a bit more who was on more of the developing and shaping of the clean cooking. Um, but I will talk about how, uh, more about CCG's philosophy in general and how the RRF is really aligned with that and then go into the narrative um, of the of the way that we're responding to this request. And I just want to say shout out to uh, engineer Kihara, who was not here today, who wasn't able to make it because he has been really um, a champion within uh, the Ministry of Energy on one of the requests. OK, so here's a bit of a narrative about how, um, from the Climate Compatible Growth Program, we've been uh, raising our hand to this Kenya RRF call. The Climate Compatible Growth Program is um, a demand-led research program. And so what that means is we want to respond to things that are relevant within our partner countries, which is Kenya. The RRF is great in such that it's structured where the demand is directly clear. And we can just say, yes, we, we have that expertise. Um, so the RRF call was developed with different stakeholders um, and within Kenya government and post. And then within, we've responded and put together a CCG. How, how did we think, you know, if we couldn't respond to the entire thing or just part of one of the requests, we would pull together an offer um, from the CCG side to then say what we had to, to offer for them. So then there would be discussion, negotiation, and then we would move into delivery phase. But CCG's offer in general, just for those who aren't aware, is usually modeling tools um, and coordination uh, around things because CCG within their uh, partner countries is not just there for um, kind of parachuting, as John mentioned, but much more about long-term long -term engagement. So while this is a rapid response, um, we aim for long-term sustainable uh, engagement and embeddedness. So then we move to the delivery, and what happens is that there's often this negotiation and co-creation. So while the request was made with stakeholders, the offer was made, um, we want to make sure we're well aligned and speaking the same language. So then there's a bit of co-creation, adjusting, making sure that we're meeting the needs, and then moving into the delivery. Now, from, and then of course for future work, from the national partnerships point of view, which is where I'm based within the program, the RRF is aligned with our strategy um, at, as a demand-led partnership program. So we have, the RRF, for example, it builds on the existing expertise within the country, and from the CCG side, we offer our research and expertise. We then do workshops and would continue discussing um, future work within the different partners in the government of Kenya. We then delivered, in certain instances, the training workshops, but have other things to offer as well. And then finally, outputs would include things like, and I'll show an example of that, you know, we have people that have the right tools uh, needed to meet their needs, and then also, of course, community of practice data, and then moving finally into evidence-based policy. And I'll talk a bit more about that. So one of the requests that came through was called the National Energy Planning Through Osmosis and Arena Flex Tool RRF Request, KE1. <laughs> um, and so what the goal of this was to have a technical assistance and capacity building on specific tools that CCG researchers have expertise in. And here's what we've been doing thus far. So this scoping workshop, and it was done over a course of at least 18 months and is continuing. The first workshop began last year, August, where it was mostly moving to scoping. And the philosophy behind this is that throughout each workshop, we move into um, where the expertise actually lies within the country, rather than it being the workshop led only by the CCG uh, experts. And then, so we've just had the sixth workshop um, last month, which was a gigantic success. And we're moving into, we would say, our par portion of the um, of the RF request was delivered, and now we're trying to see how we can move forward. So the flex tool, for example, that one has been officially handed over. And what's quite exciting now is that the uh, Kenya 
Ministry of Energy has uh, agreed to use FlexTool within their medium term plan and start developing that. So we can say that this has been a very big success in handing over. And as an anecdote, um, we received some feedback on that sixth workshop uh, where they said that this was the first time that the power sector planning team had been properly supported with new modeling tools and have really appreciated the approach that CCG had to offer to, to ensure that they really did fully understand and knew how to use the, the tools. And then now there's more. Uh, because of the engagement, because CCG is going to be within Kenya for longer than just the RRF request, we're building upon the different pillars that we have set out for this particular RRF request. So the first pillar was around this national government engagement, but we want to start moving that into pipelining um, with different educational academies and institutions, such as universities. And so we're looking at developing courses and kind of packaging that together. And then also there's mandate, particularly within the government of Kenya and Ministry of Energy, to do these county level energy plans. So we've been working with um, counties and looking at how to do data collection and bring this national team that has this capacity and expertise and how to bring that down to the county level. So these are things that are ongoing and we're continuing those conversations within the Ministry of Energy. The second request, which I want to hand over um, to Faith quickly, but just to say we have we more work from a coordination point of view on this, um, but at the moment, what the goals were was to have this national clean cooking strategy and um, also within a subset of the national cooking strategy, because there's also a bunch of strategies within having um, one of our sister programs, the Modern Energy Cooking Solutions Program called MEX, uh, working on an e-cooking, electric cooking strategy. And we responded to this, and I want to hand over uh, quickly to Faith to talk a bit more about the progress of that request and what it's been like working with us, but just to say, um, here's uh, some photos we have within CCG. We want to build up these networks that um, last longer than us. We're based at Strathmore University within Kenya, and we want you know have that coordination role and take it forward and embed and institutionalize CCG practices moving forward. So, Faith, over to you. Thank you very much, Beth. Thank you very much, Beth. Uh, I will talk about uh, the Kenyan experience developing the clean cooking strategy and the e-cooking strategy. But maybe before I go into the details, uh, I would just uh, want to reflect back on where we were before the RRF came into the Kenyan equation. Now, we had already developed uh, the Sustainable Energy for All Action Agenda 2016, and in that agenda, we had uh, a target for achieving universal clean cooking by 2030. In 2019, this target was uh, changed from 2030 to 2028. Now, after setting that target for 2028, universal clean cooking for 2028, uh, there wasn't a lot of uh, activity happening and, of course, uh, stakeholders were asking the question, we have a target to meet before 2028. What action do we have in place to meet this target? So when the RRF uh, came in, of course, uh, through the request from the Kenyan uh, government to support the process to develop the clean cooking strategy, it uh, brought about uh, a number of uh, changes in the way we were doing things. Instead of sitting there, business as usual, uh, there's a lot of uh, thinking that went into how do we get this uh, clean cooking strategy going? Uh, and how do we link it up with the electric cooking strategy? And maybe for your information, electricity for cooking in Kenya is uh, a subject that uh, has not uh, been previously discussed. This past, despite the fact that 75% uh, of the population has access to electricity, only 1% are recorded as having uh, electric cooking equipment in their households. So there's this disparity between the policy on electric, electricity cook, uh, access and uh, the cooking sector. So after agreeing to develop the strategy, there's a new thinking that has been injected into clean cooking, which is now a national agenda. 
and uh, there's a political buy-in from uh, the topmost levels in the country. And uh, through this process, we are trying to see how best to articulate the roadmap that takes us to the target we have set for 2028. Now, this process has brought together a number of uh, development partners. Among them, uh, the uh, African Development Bank. We have uh, GIZ has been uh, active on uh, improved cook stoves, but uh, they have also now come in to support the process of the national clean cooking and the e-cooking strategies. Then we have uh, Modern Energy Cooking Services, MEX, who are also supporting the same, same process for the two strategies. We have UK Pact. And this is also linking together with other agencies that are supporting clean cooking in Kenya. For example, the European Union has been supporting the energy planning process where clean cooking is a, a target uh, intervention area in the counties. What uh, Beth talked about, we are promoting uh, or encouraging the counties to view clean cooking as a high priority area and incorporate it into the county integrated development plans and also source uh, resources for implementation. Then uh, there's also the World Bank funded uh, project, the COSA project, which uh, has a cooking element. So there are synergies between uh, the national strategy and all these other initiatives that are ongoing within the country. Uh, we have also realized a strengthening of uh, synergies with uh, related uh, sectors like the health, environment, uh, gender, and the climate change uh, sectors. We have had been having discussions below be, before, but uh, right now with the clean cooking strategy uh, planning in place, we have a stronger collaboration within, uh, between the uh, ministries and the agencies responsible for these uh, interventions on health, environment, and climate change, and also gender. We have also broadened our thinking in terms of uh, how we tackle the targets for clean cooking within the country. We had set targets that uh, were not uh, informed by evidence, but under the clean cooking strategy, we are uh, have looking for more solid evidence on the broad range of uh, fuels that we are promoting, like biogas, bioethanol, uh, electricity, LPG. So we would like to have this uh, strategy anchored on a very solid uh, evidence uh, from uh, some uh, studies that will be conducted as part and parcel of uh, developing this uh, national strategy. Then we are also improving coordination between the many actors. Uh, I think uh, you may be aware that uh, there are very many actors within the clean cooking sector in Kenya both from uh, public sector, private sector, uh, civil society, uh, research institutions. We are bringing all these uh, efforts together and uh, seeing that uh, we have a very clear direction of uh, moving forward with the, with the clean cooking in the country. Now, the other uh, thing we have realized is uh, the lack of data we don't have a lot of, of course, there are many partners who have been working in the clean cooking sector have got a lot of data on uh, cooking, but uh, the way the data is handled is not really coordinated. Uh, you, there is no central place you will go and uh, derive a source of data that uh, is authentic and uh, uh, be belonging maybe to say the government. This data does not come from the government. So if, uh, our efforts uh, bear fruit, then uh, we will have a central repository for data on uh, clean cooking that will be acceptable and uh, also authentic from the government, uh, which can be a trusted source of data, which, uh, based on which uh, people can make decisions in the clean cooking sector. Then, uh, aside from that, we have also made some uh, linkages with the, the Clean Cooking Alliance, which uh, has been uh, supporting the establishment of delivery units and Kenya is one of the countries which has been, is being supported in that uh, respect. So the delivery units are basically a structure within government that uh, will help deliver on the strategies because uh, right now 
we don't have uh, strong units that uh, can uh, deli deliver on uh, such a complex strategy. You know, when you bring all these uh, fuels and technologies together, it's quite a comp complex uh, uh, act. So you need a very structured way of approaching and ensuring that uh, the targets set in the strategy are met to achieve the intended objective. Then uh, the other progress we have realized is uh, the incorporation of uh, the cooking targets within the MTEF process. That was not happening before, so clean cooking is now part and parcel of the medium-term expenditure framework, which is a good progress because unless we do that, then we cannot get uh, access to government funding. So we are happy that uh, the RRF came in when it did, and uh, for us, it's a good progress. It has also brought Kenya to the global map, and we are being used as examples of uh, progress made in clean cooking. And this all started with the elaboration of SDG 7. So I think we have... Uh, made a mark and we, we would like to continue making that mark, especially with the implementation of the strategy and ensuring that uh, the, our people in Kenya get access to clean cooking technologies and fuels. Thank you. Thank you so much, Faith. That's really wonderful to hear. <laughs> Encouraging. I hope, um, yeah, I think from, from, especially from your closing comments here, if we could go straight into the discussion, the panel discussion for the, for the final, um, yeah, just under half an hour. Of, of our meeting, really trying to discuss what made some of these technical assistance projects a success, what can we learn from them. Um, I'm sure there are lots of questions about the individual projects as well, and, and I'm sure the speakers will be very happy to clarify, but maybe we can start with some discussion on really on, on, on what worked, and, and maybe um, you know, we started with the demand side from, uh, from Ahmed, and Faith, now you, you yeah, ended talking about the impact of that work, which is, is really fantastic to see. So maybe I could ask you both to comment briefly on what made these successful projects so far? Why was this technical assistance? What, what, what's going well? But, but perhaps more important, we, we're all here to learn as well. What do you wish that was done differently in technical assistance provision so that the benefit in country is, is really maximized? So Faith and, and Ahmed, if you're not sure who wants to, to go first, uh, Ahmed, are you able to join us? Hey, we, we heard from Daniel, which is nice to hear that this is such a good partnership and feel free to, to jump in too. And, I'm just curious what what made that such a good partnership, and what can we can, what can we learn from that? Um, well, in reality, we are very very happy with this partnership, and it's very helpful uh, because it allows us to success in our main target. Our main target is to open the the markets to products, to make the private free to support the free initiative of privates. And that's, that's why it's very strategic for us. We have to success on that. I will believe strongly, I believe strongly on this uh, <coughs> key element. If we want to success, we have to have, we need to have uh, a, pro a very po powerful private sector. It's important for us. Uh, what we are doing with BASE, with Daniel, we are facilitating to private SMEs the access to funding for energy efficiency projects. Before that, because we, we had a lot of discussions, we made inquiries toward the private companies, toward insurance companies, toward banks, etc. No way before to, 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 to open the door to this kind of funding for energy efficiency projects in Morocco, it was very, very difficult, specifically when we are talking about energy performance contracts. And we want to open that. Now it's possible. That's, and really, we are so happy to allow our country to take benefit from that. Yeah, it'd be great if that's lessons learned that could be applied um, elsewhere as well. Yeah. Faith, do you want to? Oh, yeah. And then I'll, Nile, do you want to? Come in afterwards with your. Uh, I can, uh, can complement what uh, Ahmed mentioned. I think first, um, I, I would say that for the success of, of, of the program, it's key to have a partner uh, very engaged in, in this process. Uh, we have the fortune that uh, SIE has even in, the, in their blood, in the mandate, uh, the, the aspect of energy efficiency and 
and support of, of uh, SMEs and transforming the market. So that's, that's great. And the second factor is that this is a, a co-creation process. It's not base coming with a solution. Even when we have applied this model in different countries, really is uh, uh, a shared effort where uh, the, the local intelligence and the local understanding of the market has a very big weight because they know how the market works. They know how the, the different stakeholders. So we are just uh, trying to bring and share a little bit of the experience, our failures in other places, and try to guide the, the process. But I would say that th those two factors are key for the success of the project. Definitely agree with you, Daniel. And we had, we had uh, many, many debates. And uh, these debates are, you know, because of these debates, we have a good result today. And, uh, you know, our experience, I, 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 I listened to what is done in Kenya. I'm convinced that we have a lot to learn from Kenya experience. And from today, I invite Kenya to join us and to discuss with, to open discussion with us and to be part of our, the, the African Super Esco Club. I know that you have some discussions with our main partner in this club, which is the African Open Bank. And uh, you are more than welcome to, sincerely, to, to share experiences. Mila, did, did you want to come in here? This is something that oh, we've discussed I, 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 a lot on how I, countries can learn I, from each exactly, other. Exactly. No, I was delighted by that invitation. I think actually the points that Daniel and Ahmed and, and actually John before made are, are really important, which is, you know, when we look at it from the RF point of view and our role as a coordinating hub and facilitating solutions, what I found most important is, is to have the humility to take your time and understand the local circumstances and to have clarity from the local stakeholders in terms of what the actual issues are before we jump to conclusions as to what the solutions might be. Because I think historically, you know, John made the point about all the reports that are sitting on a shelf somewhere. I think there's been a culture of uh, one size fits all solutions. And actually what we've learned in RF, that's not, not really the right way forward. It's about building capacity with local stakeholders so that they are, you know, able to articulate what they've achieved so far and where the actual needs are. And then, as I say, to have the humility to, to focus on those needs rather than the solutions that we might want to supply. And I think that's been a, a really good learning process, certainly for me and for the hub. And I think it's one that will allow us in future to continue to have these excellent um, outcomes and indeed, to go to that next level of, of transferring learnings between projects and countries, which I think is, is really helping to make the outcomes multiplicative in nature. So thank you, yes. John, do you, do you maybe want to, because you um, explained a number of case studies in different countries, was there anything that worked really well in one country in approach, not, not just a technical solution, but the way that you worked and engaged with them, that actually didn't work so well elsewhere? And, and how did you decide on that? How Was that the partnerships that we talked about earlier? Or was there some other like local knowledge of, this, of, the, of the market and of the, the culture of the people, of the needs and the, the challenges and opportunities? Mm -hmm. how, how do you decide like your, your, your target when you go into different countries to, to help with these, with these issues? Yeah, thanks for the question. That's quite a tricky question to answer, <laughs> uh, to give a specific example, but yes, of course. The, the landscape of Vietnam, Philippines, and Indonesia, we, where we work, is quite different. So what works in Indonesia and Philippines won't work in Vietnam, for example. Um, in the Philippines, it's very much private sector driven, to the extent that there's probably a case in multiple areas of regulatory capture. So. The way we go in the Philippines is to support the government, um, possibly to empower them with a dialogue with the private sector. Um, so two RF requests we responded to. One is updating the grid code to make it more renewable energy friendly, say in simple terms. And another was to look at the market mechanisms for battery energy storage. Um, we, ha we approached this work with the government, empowering the government 
each step because the private sector would like to drive both of them pieces of work. Um, there's more money in the private sector and there's, there's a lot more strength. So whilst working with the Philippine government, uh, this approach of almost shielding them from the influence of the private sector is important. Um, whereas in Vietnam, uh, it's, it's a very, very strong government uh, who are approaching, whose energy system is entirely top-down, it's entirely vertical, and they have complete control of the entire system. Um, in a way, it's easier for the energy transition in Vietnam because once they make a decision, they can go with it. But then we have other issues with civil society or with, with, with other aspects that come in. So it's not an easy question to answer. We can take it subject by subject and it's a long discussion. Uh, but yes, we have to approach them very differently. And I think to relate to the, the comment we just had, it, it, we have to be very humble uh, and we have to work with local stakeholders and we have to build carefully our understanding of where we're going and what we're trying to do because coal fares down in Indonesia looks very different to coal fares down in uh, Vietnam and the socio-political element that I mentioned before is critical to the success as I think we've learned from the South Africa JetP there's there's a lot of work that needs to take place over let's say all aspects to move forward thank you yeah, quite very good to hear that and, and Beth maybe that's something that TCG is trying to do also to to em embed the program in the country to learn and had to have that knowledge of the context and and how the systems work, how decisions are made, investments are made, et cetera. That we have, in a way, that luxury in CCG that we can do that long term. But do you have any suggestions for how organizations that don't have that time and just provide a, a, a report, how could they still benefit from that or do something? Is, or is that, yeah, because everybody has to build these long term relationships? And, uh, um, great question. Yeah, uh, I think, I think. To be able to make the largest impact, um, you want to build long, longer-term sustained relationships. But um, to the to the word rapid and rapid response, I would say, um, actually, the quick delivery shows urgency and shows that it's a high priority. So there's benefit in saying, let's do this quickly because we care a lot. Um, and that might help with messaging, at least initially. But in order to in ensure that things are embedded, I think a long-term, already thinking about long-term would be very, very important. Yeah, that's from my faith. Do you have any thoughts about that? Yeah, I'll just add, just to echo what you have said, the rapid response was really rapid in terms of uh, the response to the Kenyan request. And for us, it has uh, served as well. But uh, in addition to that, it uh, brought together a number of uh, agencies and uh, it built on the local knowledge base. Rather than uh, starting things afresh, we are actually building on what was there before. And also recognizing that uh, there are different needs for different communities within Kenya that need to be addressed differently, and therefore the strategy has to take into account the type of fuels, the type of technologies, the kind of people that we are dealing with, and ensure that uh, the right technology is uh, delivered to, to the right people. Mm -hmm. So there are all, there's all this talk about business models and all that. Uh, you know, we have to develop different business models for different uh, groups as the need arises. Mm -hmm. So to me, the RRF has a uh, kind of uh, come in to really address this need deeply, and we are grateful. Thank you. Yeah. Are there any questions from, from the room here? And, and maybe, Ile, you can have a look on Slido, what's coming on online, but are there people in, in the room here who want to comment, that maybe been involved in other technical assistance projects, um, things that went well, things that were difficult, again, partnerships and local conditions? Ah, yeah. Thanks, Mark. Uh, your microphone. Well, maybe as a comment or a question to, to everybody, but I think something that you all said or, or implied was that trust building was, was critical. Could you tell us a little bit more about that? And what's the recipe? Is it something that you can do fast, or does it just mean, look, you must spend time, face time with the people concerned and build that uh, build that slowly because I guess we all want to put these into terms of reference for projects and technical assistance 
And it's just very easy for a consultant to tick something on a box to say, oh, yes, I've built trust. But you know, how, how is that done? Thank you. Anybody in particular keen to respond to that? I think that's, yeah, I think it, everybody has said something about trust building in this relationship. So, uh, yeah, sure, that, that's a good question, Mac. Uh, I don't think there's a golden answer which applies in all countries, but I think this comes down to the fundamental rules of how trust is built anywhere. Um, so, coming at the work with sincerity, uh, there's a certain level of advocacy involved in our work, but it's not at the core. Uh, we're pushing. Oh, sorry, we're supporting an evidence-based energy transition. I think this is critical uh, to work with the governments to assess all options in a fair and transparent way, I think is key. Uh, secondly, I think having on the ground uh, individuals to build that relation day by day is also very important. I, it's not perhaps completely necessary. I think going to the earlier question, it's possible to have, uh, not possible, completely necessary to have international expertise come into the country where that expertise doesn't exist. I think that's the whole point in development partners to support. But then that puts the importance on local partnerships. So finding and working with a local partner who is already trusted and building on that relationship, I think, is also very critical. Yeah, I'm curious to hear your yeah. thoughts also working at maybe a different scale. You're not a GIZ or, or, uh, or even a CCG's like size, but you apply your work in a number of exactly. countries and you and, need to and I can tell that trust is probably one of the most important aspects that we uh, build uh, in any project in order to to be able to move forward work together collaborate uh, co create as I was mentioning before and as well it's not a recipe on how how to do that in advance uh, uh, in this case I can tell you um, we have a, a, an intermediary, which all of you know, is Dan Hamza, which uh, we have been working with Dan for many years. There was a trust link already there, and he actually helped to drive this trust uh, with the uh, SEI, and we have been working with the ESI team and building trust in these months, uh, working together. So that has been something that, um, as well, is a, is a continuous uh, effort around. I can tell you as well that it's very challenging and takes longer to build uh, trust uh, virtually. So during COVID, it took us quite a lot of effort to connect with people. It's easier when you have a face-to-face -face meeting with someone and you you touch them or they touch you and then you see that. Uh, so that that um, aspect is, is um, again, fortunately we have it again, but uh, um, that helps a lot. Uh, on my part, I would say that uh, the partners who came to work with us uh, on the clean cooking strategy are really not uh, strange in the room or in the Kenyan uh, context, because these are people we have worked with. We have worked with the UK, we have worked with AFD, we have worked with GIZ, the World Bank is already in the country doing a number of projects. So I think working with somebody you have... Uh, worked with before strengthens uh, your ability to take things forward and uh, therefore we did not uh, have any trust issues with the people who are coming on board to implement this and I think that is it, it explains the speed at which the agreement happened and uh, the initiation of the whole discussion about uh, clean cooking. Thank you. And on the reverse side of the other request in uh, in Kenya, we, we actually didn't have much of a relationship as to how this initially with uh, engineer Kihara. And um, however, that built of trust, having that country coordinator that we build um, within the CCG program in our partner countries really helped launch and ensure that we were we were going to be coordinated and the trust built within the country was was established that way. Um, and then I think sincerity uh, um, and being able to deliver, the reliability, setting out the plan, um, all these were factors that I think really helped us show that we could deliver um, when we might not have had that relationship initially. And the importance of the partner coordinator in the country, and just to say I didn't talk about the Laos RRF request, 
um, that John actually <laughs> was was kind of spearheading as well. Um, in Laos, having the country coordinator who who is well trusted, well known, it it makes all the difference for sure. We, we have five minutes left in the meeting, and I know John there's a, a taxi uh, waiting outside to yeah. go back to the blue zone. So we'll wrap up in uh, yeah in time as planned. Uh, Nila, you've been keeping an eye on the questions that come in online as well. I hope is there anything that fits. Well yes, so maybe maybe we'll pick one which is about, uh, it's a question for Daniel, it says what can other countries learn from SME financing of energy efficient equipment, uh, especially if they have weak currencies with, with high and presumably fluctuating exchange rates and inflation. So how can, how can we um, support countries in financing for SMEs to acquire energy efficient equipment? Because you know, one of the things I think is very important is we we are not wanting to constrain economic growth. So we do want people to, to be using the, the most efficient and best equipment. But what are the financing models and what can we learn, especially if you've got these exchange rate issues as well? Yeah, I would say that we have the fortune that energy efficiency... Um, is in most of the countries is very profitable. So you 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 have very short time uh, uh, payback periods. Uh, so here is only to finding the right formula, the right business model uh, or, or financial mechanism behind that is appropriate to the customer that is in the other side. And in this case, it's not the same to talk about um, an SME than to talk about uh, a public entity. It's not the same that to talk of uh, energy efficiency in a household because e each of them, they present different different challenges and characteristics. It doesn't make any sense to talk of an energy savings insurance for a household that they want to replace the refrigerator. They, they think in a different way. It says, it says that the motivation is different and the way to offer these products should be in a different manner. Uh, so I would say that uh, the way to support this uh, is to try to find out um, what are the motivations of the stakeholders that you have in the other side. And I, we, we always said in the in, in base, in the office that I work, uh, there are two ways to move the donkey. You have the stick and you have the carrot. The stick being the policy, so you have a strong policy tomorrow, then the donkey's gonna move. And the, the challenge comes when you don't have that strong stick, then you need to have a big and juicy carrot in the other side. And the challenge is that this donkey has many carrot possibilities. So. How do you make that carrot of energy efficiency more juicy, more attractive, more orange that that donkey should jump to that one? Uh, that's that's where we are focused every day on, on answer, trying to answer that question and try to paint and, and, and dress that carrot in different ways to attract that donkey to energy efficiency. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Very helpful. I'll, I'll pick up another question and I'll, I'll say a couple of things myself about it because it's a good question. So this question is, while these partnerships are demand-led, would you say a balance of demand-led and product-led is more efficient than a purely demand-led strategy? So, in fact, when we started the RF, it was deliberately entirely demand-led within the broad themes of the Energy Transition Council. So it was within the scope of what the Energy Tra Transition Council was trying to achieve, particularly around the electricity system. We allowed the RF to be absolutely responsive and demand-led. However, going forward, what we're doing is we're essentially advertising eight themes around our capabilities. And so we want to make our stakeholder community aware of the areas in which we feel we particularly have very good expertise from, from what we've learned. And so we are actually moving forward in, in, in a slightly more balanced approach. We will always be demand-led and we will always respond to and listen to all kinds of requests because I think RF is partly there to fill gaps and make sure that we are helping countries with their energy transitions. But we are also advertising eight thematic areas where we think we can particularly um, provide support. So uh, we're always interested to hear from other people if, if they have other good ideas. So Kuna, I'll, I'll hand back to you and I think probably... Yes. We have to come to up. the end of our slot. It's, uh, it's gone very fast. It's been a, a fantastic discussion, and thanks, thanks very much for joining us, and, and Ahmed for joining us online. Uh, it's been so good to hear from, from you all and uh, the impact that this work makes, uh, the lessons learned from that. Um, 
I know you have to dash off, others may be around a little bit longer, so if you're in the room, um, grab, uh, grab a member of the uh, panel to, uh, to keep talking. Uh, there's some coffee and tea outside. But um, thanks once again uh, for, uh, for all the speakers, for, for you in the audience um, here and, and online. And uh, just one last comment I want to make is that on Energy Day, the ETC has an event on the RF um, in the UK Pavilion uh, in the Blue Zone. So if you're around on Energy Day, please join, uh, join that session to hear from, uh, from a different uh, set of, um, of, of speakers, um, different organizations covered. So hopefully that will uh, be of interest. So once again, thank you for being here and hand back to, to you, Baron. Thank you. Just wanted to say another thanks to our chairs and our panelists and also for everyone that listened to this session. Please make sure you come along to our next session at four, talking about African energy pathways. Thank you.